The Anglo-Boer War in South Africa between 1899 and 1902 was the most costly conflict fought by Queen Victoria's British Army. 20,000 British and 14,000 Boer troops, along with 26,000 Boer civilians and an estimated 20,000 black Africans, lost their lives. And the scars of that conflict still shape attitudes in South Africa to this day. But do you know that for a tantalising moment, one man might have averted this terrible bloodshed? General Sir William Butler was an enigmatic member of Sir Garnet Wolseley's Ashanti Ring of Officers in the British Army during the late 19th century. Married to one of the most famous artists of the day, he served in Wolseley's Red River Campaign in Canada, the Ashanti War in West Africa, the Zulu War, Wolseley's Egyptian Campaign and the Nile Expedition to save General Charles Gordon in Khartoum. An organiser who fell in love with the remote wilds of Canada and was instrumental in the formation of the Northwest Mounted Police. Butler was also an accomplished writer and historian, so a thinking general in the Victorian British Army. And yet, despite being part of Queen Victoria's army as it painted large parts of the globe British red, he was also a passionate supporter of Irish home rule and of Boer independence in South Africa. And indeed, there was a brief moment where he came tantalisingly close to preventing the Second Anglo-Boer War, and how history might have been different if he had done so. A man described as that brilliant but impossible Irishman. This is the story that I've previously told to my members of General Sir William Butler. William Butler was born into a minor Catholic gentry family in County Tipperary, Ireland, in 1838. During his youth, he was to witness firsthand the desolation of the potato famine in rural Ireland. What little money his father did have, he spent on trying to help alleviate the suffering. Those memories were to stay with William Butler for the rest of his life, and often led to him championing the underdog, as we'll discover later. Following an education at a Jesuit college, in 1858 he began his 47-year career in the British Army. Butler was commissioned as an ensign, the most junior officer rank at the time, with the 69th Regiment of Foot. They would go on to become the 2nd Battalion, the Welsh Regiment, in 1881. Almost immediately, he was heading abroad, as the 69th were ordered to fight in the 2nd Anglo-Burmese War. There, he briefly met another young officer, who would be injured by a musket ball, Garnet Wolseley. Their careers would be intertwined for the rest of his military life. Following the war, the 69th were posted to Madras in India. There, young Butler chaffed against the monotony of garrison duties, and he began writing to break the boredom. It was the start of a hobby that would see him write highly regarded books about 19th century Canada, as well as biographies of General Charles Gordon, George Coley, and Sir Charles Napier. Finally, his regiment's tour of duty ended, and they were sent back to Britain. En route home, Butler managed to stop off at St Helena. This tiny island in the mid-Atlantic between Africa and Brazil had been the final exile of Napoleon Bonaparte. Butler had a lifelong fascination and admiration for all things Napoleon. He trekked up the slopes of the volcanic island to Longwood House, where the exiled French emperor had died in 1821. St Helena remains a British overseas territory to this day, a tiny vestige of an empire that once, with the help of men like Butler, controlled a quarter of the globe. Arriving back in Britain in 1867, his regiment were posted to the Channel Islands, and there he met the French author, Victor Hugo. They were to remain lifelong friends. His stay in the Channel Islands was cut short after a year, when the 69th was sent to Canada to counter the Fenian raids from America. Those raids by Irish Republicans, most of whom had served in the Union Army during the American Civil War, are something I might cover in a future episode. What do you think? Drop me a comment below with yes or no. With little money or influence in an age where promotions in the British Army were still purchased, Butler had little reason to rush home to Britain. Thus he stayed on in Canada, exploring the western wilderness. In October 1870, he embarked upon a five-month, 2,700-mile round trip from Quebec to the Rockies. He fell in love with the beauty of the untamed Canadian wilderness, and the native people he met en route. He recorded his travels in a book published in 1872, entitled The Great Lone Land. It was to be reprinted 17 times before his death, 
and fans of the book included Theodore Roosevelt, Winston Churchill and John Ruskin. In the meantime, in 1870, he volunteered to serve in Garnet Wolseley's Red River Expedition to deal with a rebellion led by Louis Riel in modern-day Winnipeg. Wolseley had already filled his staff, but remembering Butler from Burma and impressed by his knowledge of the Canadian wilderness, he gave him a special mission to travel via the USA to Riel's headquarters and gather intelligence. His arrival at the remote centre of the rebellion, Fort Garry, could hardly have been kept undercover. Butler must have stuck out like a sore thumb. He was actually invited to meet Riel and agreed to convey his demands to Wolseley. The British officer then left Fort Garry by canoe and paddled his way to the advancing British expedition. Wolseley's rapid advance unnerved the rebels. Riel fled to the USA and the rebellion fizzled out with almost no bloodshed. With the Red River expedition complete, Butler once more chose to stay on in Canada. In 1872, he was finally promoted to the rank of captain, having served 12 years as a lieutenant. With the publicity surrounding the Great Lone Land, he was also made a fellow of the Royal Geographic Society. The following year, he embarked on yet another epic journey through the Canadian wilderness, this time travelling by foot, horse, canoe and dog sled all the way to the Pacific coast. It resulted in yet another book, The Wild Northland. Based upon his journey, he advocated the formation of the Northwest Mounted Police. His travels also made him highly sympathetic to the Native Americans and the way that their lifestyle was being eroded by European influence. This sympathy found a voice in Butler's novel, Red Cloud, The Solitary Sioux, published in 1882. It was the first, but not the last time, he would advocate the cause of the underdog as Britain expanded her empire. His exploits during the Red River expedition had impressed Wolseley so much that he sent Butler a message to join him on his next expedition, the Ashanti War in West Africa. Butler raced across the Atlantic to Britain, only to find that Wolseley had already departed for modern-day Ghana. Nevertheless, he caught the next ship available and landed just a few days after Wolseley. Once in West Africa, he was given the task of raising a local regiment of Africans to support the invasion of the Ashanti Kingdom. He became one of Wolsey's fabled Ashanti Ring of Officers, who would play key roles in many of the military conflicts during the latter part of the 19th century. As it was, Butler's scratch regiment of locals proved unreliable when facing the fearsome Ashanti, and Butler himself succumbed to a tropical fever. This resulted in him being sent home to Netley Hospital for two months. Netley Hospital was a massive military hospital on the shores of the Solent in Hampshire, built during the Crimean War. The story of the hospital is another one that I will tell you in the future. Now very much part of Wolseley's gang, he joined his mentor in South Africa, where Wolseley had been appointed governor of the Natal colony. Here, Butler, with his champion of the underdog, was given the task of protecting the welfare of Indian migrants, principally working in the colony's sugar plantations. In 1877, Butler married Elizabeth Thompson. Now, that name might not mean a lot to you, but her married name, Lady Elizabeth Butler, might. And if you're still struggling, then you might recognise some of her paintings. She became one of the foremost military artists in the 19th century, and her paintings are on display in such prestigious locations as the Tate, Staff College, at University College Dublin, the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne, and the Royal Collection. Her works include one of the most famous paintings of the defence of Rourke's Drift, plus several depicting battles from the Crimean War. Then there is the work entitled Remnants of an Army, showing the forlorn figure of Dr William Bryden approaching Jalalabad following the massacre of the British Army at Gandamag in Afghanistan. Possibly her most famous is the iconic Scotland Forever, depicting the charge of the Scots Greys at Waterloo. In 1882, General Wolseley was placed in command of an expeditionary force heading to Egypt to quell the Arabi Pasha Rebellion. Once more, Wolseley gathered his Ashanti ring of officers to act a bit like his own personal general staff. And naturally, William Butler, now a colonel, was amongst them. He was present at the battles of Kassassin and its famous Moonlight Cavalry Charge and the climax of the campaign at the Battle of Tel El Kabir. He'd only just returned to Britain to take up the prestigious post of aide-de-camp, sort of a military secretary, to Queen Victoria herself, 
when he was once more called back to Egypt by Wolseley. This time, Sir Garnet was leading an expedition to rescue General Charles Gordon, who was besieged by forces loyal to the Mahdi in Khartoum, Sudan. I have covered this whole campaign in several previous talks, so please forgive me for not going into loads of details here, but I will post some links in the description below. Based upon his experiences during the Red River expedition, Wolseley decided that he would transport his whole army up the River Nile in boats. The British army had never attempted such an undertaking on such a scale before. The Royal Navy, who believed themselves to be experts in anything that floated, informed Wolseley that he would need 400 boats for the task. Quite frankly, they continued, gathering that many vessels would take at least three months. <laughs> that wasn't the answer Wolseley wanted to hear. If the Royal Navy couldn't gather 400 boats fast, he would give the job to someone who could. He turned to Butler. It says a lot about his estimation of the Irishman that Wolseley entrusted this critical part of the campaign to him. Put simply, if he couldn't transport his army by boat, there would be no way he could march his army all the way to Khartoum in time to save Gordon. He had chosen well. Butler gathered the 400 boats, and he did it not in three months as estimated by the Royal Navy, but in just one month. Now, that's an impressive achievement. In the end, despite Butler's Herculean efforts to secure the river transport, Wolseley's expedition failed to reach Gordon in time. Wolseley decided that the best boatmen who could navigate the various rapids on the Nile were the Canadian boatmen, or voyageurs, that he'd used back on the Red River expedition. The delay in waiting for those voyageurs to arrive all the way from Canada probably cost Gordon his life. Interestingly, some people have speculated that Wolseley wasn't the only person in the Ashanti ring who loved all things Canadian. There was another, William Butler. Was it Butler who gave Wolseley the idea of bringing the boatman halfway round the world and thus delaying the expedition? Maybe. One thing I will say in Butler's defence was that Wolseley had a habit of blaming anybody except himself when things went wrong. On this particular expedition, he blamed Buller for the slow gathering of camels for the flying column and was very vocal in blaming Brigadier Wilson for reaching Khartoum too late. If he could have shifted some blame away from himself and on to Butler, his form suggests that he probably would have. But on the boatman, Wolseley was silent, so maybe it was his idea all along. Butler returned to Britain and a series of desk jobs. During this period, he started to get the reputation in some quarters as a bit of a rebel. His constant criticisms of the conditions for ordinary soldiers irked many in the Victorian establishment. But it was his political forays that really set alarm bells ringing. Butler, who was already a friend of Irish nationalist Charles Stuart Parnell, now wrote to the government advocating Irish home rule. For a serving officer to express these sentiments was both highly risky and highly inflammatory. It was probably only the protection offered by Wolseley, who in 1894 became Commander-in-Chief of the British Army, which saved his career. Based upon his slightly anti-imperial stance, his next senior appointment was a bit of a surprise. In 1898, he was appointed as Commander-in-Chief in South Africa. If there was a volatile region in the British Empire in 1898, well, apart from the northwest frontier in India and demands for Irish home rule, it was the situation between the British and the Boer republics at the southern tip of Africa. Relations between the two white communities had always been feisty. Back in the 1830s, the Boers had simply packed their wagons and headed into the interior to get away from British rule in the Cape. There, they set up their own republics, free from British interference. Not that the local black African populations always welcomed their arrival. Various British imperialists had always had designs to create some sort of South African confederation as part of the British Empire, sort of on the lines of Canada. Naturally, the newly independent Boers weren't keen on that idea. However, in the late 1870s, they had, for a variety of reasons, accepted British rule. Just prior to the Boers surrendering their independence, Butler, who was serving Wolseley in Natal, was sent to the Boer Republic of the Orange Free State to assess whether they would acquiesce to joining the empire or would have to be forced to do so. Butler came away with a healthy respect for the Boers, both their aspirations, their knowledge of the land and their fighting abilities, and it would influence his latter actions. Within a few years, the Boers realised that the grass wasn't greener on the other side 
and rose in revolt. They defeated the British under another Ashanti Ring member, General Sir George Coley, at the Battle of Majuba. Indeed, Coley was killed in action. It was left to another member of the Ring, Sir Evelyn Wood, to negotiate a treaty granting the Boers their independence once more. So, by 1898, British imperialists like Cecil Rhodes and the British High Commissioner, Lord Milner, felt there was unfinished business with the Boer republics. This wasn't helped by the fact that in the ensuing years, gold had been discovered in one of the republics, the Transvaal, officially known as the South African Republic. European immigrants called Eightlanders had flocked to the gold fields near Johannesburg. The Boers, under their president, Paul Kruger, feared that they would soon become a minority in their own country. They refused these immigrants the vote, or any say in the running of the country. Combined with selective punitive taxes and high-handed attitudes from some officials towards them, notably the police, discontent amongst these immigrants started to grow. The majority of these Eightlanders, and indeed the mine owners, were British, and now they looked to the British government for support. People like Cecil Rhodes and Lord Milner saw an opportunity to use the Eightlander discontent to justify an armed intervention which would bring the republics back into the empire. In fact, just after Christmas in 1895, Cecil Rhodes had sent his own private police force into the Transvaal, supposedly at the request of the Eightlanders to overthrow Kruger's government. This Jameson raid ended in abject failure, but had raised tensions to even higher levels. Just two years later, Butler arrived as Commander-in-Chief of the British Army in South Africa. He was aghast at the situation he found on the ground. Firstly, the High Commissioner, Lord Milner, seemed intent to find a cause to go to war with the Boers. Secondly, from his military vantage point, Butler was appalled at the minuscule army at his disposal. If Milner provoked a war, he wasn't sure his forces could defend the British colonies, let alone launch an invasion of the Boer republics. Butler's sense of injustice and support for the underdog came to the surface. How could such a war by the British be justified? Butler refused Milner's demands to move British forces to the borders. He certainly didn't want to threaten the Boers. Moreover, if by doing so the British provoked the Boers, then his forces up on the border could easily be isolated by the numerically superior enemy. Better to keep them back and respond to any military conflict should it arise. Milner was furious, and relations between Britain's chief political man in South Africa and her chief military man rapidly went downhill. Towards the end of 1898, Butler at least gained some breathing space as Milner returned to London for three months. As Commander-in-Chief, Butler was appointed Acting High Commissioner. And it was in this new role that he received a delegation of eight Londoners from Johannesburg. They presented him with a petition to Queen Victoria asking for her government to use every means at its disposal to help alleviate their misery. Butler, who regarded them with suspicion, wondering both who controlled them and exactly how many Eightlanders they spoke for, refused to pass it on. In December 1898, in a speech at Grahamstown, Butler set out his position. Quote, Unity is strength, but it should be a union of hearts, not a union forced by outside pressure. To my mind, South Africa needs no surgical operations. It needs peace and rest, unquote. In other words, no more Jameson raids, no more sabre-rattling from the British. He went on to say that a war between the Boers and the British would be a calamity for both and for South Africa. With the benefit of hindsight, many would probably agree with him. Milner, Rhodes and the aggressive imperialists were incandescent. Butler responded by sending a cable to the colonial secretary in London, Joseph Chamberlain, warning him that the hawks were dragging Britain into a war for which she wasn't prepared. Furthermore, he warned that the Boers would be far more implacable foes than Milner and co. believed. History was to prove him right on both these counts, too. However, General Sir William Butler was sailing against the prevailing wind. The press dubbed him a Krugerite, and more and more highly placed people were having a word in the ear of his boss, Wolseley. With pressure mounting on him, and frustrated both at the lack of preparedness and the seeming determination to have a war despite their lack of preparation, Butler resigned. Milner and the imperialists were triumphant, and by October 1899, less than a year after Butler's speech in Grahamstown, they had their war. 
Just as Butler had predicted, the Boers were far harder to beat than the jingoistic imperialists had imagined. The British troops who had been moved to the border were surrounded at Mafeking, Kimberley and Ladysmith, just as he had also predicted. It would take a British army of half a million men to defeat a Boer army less than one-fifth of that size, and cost the British taxpayers £200 million, £20 billion in today's money. The war would last for three years and cost the lives of 20,000 British soldiers and 14,000 Boer fighters. It would also result in the deaths of 26,000 Boer civilians held in British internment or concentration camps. And let's not forget that this white man's war also cost the lives of around 20,000 black Africans too. The memories of that war, not least the concentration camps, shaped South African politics through the 20th century and still shape many Afrikaners' views of the British to this day. But despite being proved correct about the Boers, Butler's best days were past him and he finally retired from the army shortly after the war had concluded. In 1905 he moved back to his native island. He lived out the rest of his days in Banshe Castle where he continued his passions for writing, history and education sitting on the Senate of the National University of Ireland. He also continued to take a keen interest in the political future of Ireland, counting the leading nationalist John Redmond as a friend. General Sir William Butler died in June 1910 and was buried with full military honours in County Tipperary. He was survived by Lady Butler, who passed away in 1933. One of his sons, Patrick Butler, was awarded the DSO while serving with the Royal Welsh Fusiliers during the First World War. He was to become a Lieutenant Colonel with that regiment. Another son, Richard, would become a Catholic priest and serve as a chaplain in the British Army during World War I and as an RAF chaplain during World War II. Compared to some of Wolsey's Ashanti rings, such as Buller and Sir Evelyn Wood, Butler was a thinking soldier. In his autobiography, he pointedly wrote, when I look back over 47 years of service, the thing that astonishes me is the entire absence of the thinking faculty in 9 out of 10 of the highest grade officers with whom I associated. Many, when considering some of the senior commanders in both the Boer and the First World Wars, might agree. But he wasn't just a thinker. His flair for organisation was exhibited when he gathered those 400 boats in a month for Wolseley's Nile expedition. And yet, as a thinker and a man who supported the underdog, he was in a tantalising position to have averted the Boer War, had the prevailing imperialist mood not been against him, and how history might have been very different if his, rather than Milner's and Cecil Rhodes's views, had been listened to. If this has whetted your appetite to find out more about the Anglo-Boer War or the rest of General Sir Garnet Wolsey's Ashanti Ring, then please do watch my videos. There's links appearing, well, about now. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share, and also support my channel by becoming a patron or joining my members extra channel. Details are in the description box below. Thanks for your support. Keep well, and I'll see you again very soon.